Welcome back. This is week five, lecture one, um, the economy of salvation and late medieval theology, um, or something close to that, uh, the economy of salvation and late medieval theology. I got that right. Okay. Um, this is an important lecture. I mean, not that there are unimportant lectures in my view, um, but this is a lecture that follows up with what we've been talking about uh, in some ways since the first week. Um, but it is more directly relevant to Martin Luther. Now, as you know, I hope by now, uh, my concept of the Reformation of the later Middle Ages was developed as um, not simply in relationship to Luther, but to say this period, all that was going on, all that I've talked about, the political theory, the um, urgency, the apocalypticism, the pastoral theology, the catechesis endeavor, the observant movement, especially heightened by the, the, the schism, um, the pastoral endeavor, the sense of urgency that Christendom was in need of reformation and had members, um, kind of epitomized in the reformation of the emperor Sigismund, which you've read. That that is in and of itself important to understand the later Middle Ages. And that I think is very, I, I certainly would argue for that. And that that is the context of Luther, at least early Luther. So we need to see Luther as part of this Reformation of the later Middle Ages, at least to begin with, and not simply as, okay, we begin everything with Luther and we'll acknowledge somewhat, you know, as something lesser, but there were, you know, forerunners or there were forebearers or there was other developments, but they, they never really led to much. Now, that is a false approach, in my view, as I hope you know. But to understand Luther, because there's, I, I don't, certainly don't mean to say that Luther was not important, because he certainly was, and we'll be talking about that, uh, I think, next week we get into Luther. Um, he certainly was for understanding what was going on in the 16th century, um, and for, therefore, for the rest of, of European history in somewhat many ways. And w even if it was not so much because if he was so great, and certainly not in my view in any case that he was, you know, God's divine instrument to change the world. Um, but historically looking his, what he did and what his writings did and what his positions were had an impact that did change the world in a way that Jordan Quedlinburg didn't. Even though I think, as you know, that Jordan was really important for our understanding of the later middle ages and therefore for our understanding of the context out of which Luther developed and in which Luther developed. And this lecture then kind of brings a lot of that all together. Um, because I, th I think I referenced this in the previous lecture, what developed, especially after the schism, was a real economic approach to salvation. One of the big myths that you'll hear repeated over and over and over again is that the distinction between medieval Catholicism and Luther and Protestantism was Protestants focus on salvation by grace or justification by grace and faith, whereas the Catholics, it's all works, works righteousness. Now, that is absolutely a false dichotomy. That is coming from Luther and his followers and their critiques of the Catholic tradition. Now, my point here is not to defend the Catholic position, but to say that that approach, that critique is not historically accurate. It'd be like saying, okay, we're going to look at, um, we're going to describe what the Republican positions are, if we're historians, in 2023, but we're only going to look at what the Democrats have to say about the Republicans. And then we're going to look at the Democratic positions, but we're only going to look at what the Republicans say about the Democrats. Do you see what I'm getting at? Because that would be a completely false dichotomy. Because what the Republicans are saying about the Democrats and what the Democrats are saying about the Republicans are politically charged exaggerations of positions. Now, I'm not being political here. I'm not trying to be political here in any way, case, or, or form. But the point is you can't take that, let's say, political rhetorical bantering as the historical reality. Even if there are kernels of truth there, if that makes sense. 
But that's not the point. The point here is that when you have the Luther's position, and we'll see this when you read his his um, theses against scholastic theology, um, he condemns all of medieval theology. And he does so, as I will be arguing next week and so, on very little in understanding and knowledge. So we're not going to understand what Luther was really getting at or the context in which he developed if we take that f fierce, propagandistic, tension battle language as reality. So, I mean, the, the, the idea of works righteousness that was condemned in 14, 18, or 418 uh, with Pelagius and Pelagianism. No one really argued that thereafter. There are certainly differences. But we'll actually see in a few weeks, actually, it's not sure when we get there, but when we get to the Catholic Reformation, um, Catholic Canon Reformation, we get to the, 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 the decrees of the Council of Trent, um, you'll see that, that the decree on justification at Trent, uh, which set Catholic doctrine until the 19, early 1960s with Vatican II. Um, it's almost Luther's dis, this, uh, definition, word for word, in terms of passive righteousness, um, what God works in us, and it's not any, has anything to do with works whatsoever. That was also the context of kind of the Catholic position, but it was more nuanced because we also have that scriptural passage in James that you know, uh, faith without works is dead. So we could say that it's faith and faith active in love as it was um, actually formulated, um, fides caritate formata, um, a faith formed in love, and love was how you treated your neighbor and everyone else. Now, the Protestants have something different. Now, on the one hand, in terms of the religious experience of, of the, the, the average believer, it's not much difference. Should you do good works? Absolutely. Luther said that I will be known as the teacher of good works because I teach how and why good works are actually good. And so it is, the, the subtleties are on this more upper level academic understanding of theology and the relationship between justification and sanctification, which I'll be talking about later. But in any case, it's easy to see how the perception was that justification, salvation, was about works. Especially after the schism, because there is a shift in theological approach, in the focus, and everything else, which I'll be talking about in a bit, um, after the schism. Whereby this economic transactional approach uh, became to dominate. And we'll talk about that when we get there shortly. But first, if we want to talk about late medieval theology, the economy of salvation, we have to start with the context of what we're talking about, because we're talking about, at least here, academic theology, theology at the universities. And that is important for understanding Luther and what was going on at the time and understanding his theses against scholastic theology and his 95 theses as well. It's even been said that the, they referred to the Reformation, meaning Luther's Reformation, was a university event. It was an issue of the universities. I think I already mentioned, I think talking about the observant movement and, and everything, I believe I did, that one of the references for the Reformation was the university curriculum, the Reformation of Studies. And that was there also in Wittenberg, which was a recently founded university in 1502 by Frederick the Wise. I'll be talking about that more, too, next week in the context of Luther. So we need to look at medieval universities um, for understanding late medieval theological development um, and then the, the, the spread of academic theology, academic scholarly theology, to the popular level, to the issue of religion, the trans, almost the translation of theology into religion. Now, again, I'm beginning to spend more time on simply the introduction than I certainly had planned, and we have a lot to get through today. Um, and I'm not sure if I'm going to because th this is important material. Um, it's material I know very well because I, I, this is what I study, um, along with the Augustinianism and everything else, but in Luther himself as well. So this is really going to be difficult for me to um, condense and present to you in 
a reasonably manageable amount of time. Uh, but it's so important that I think I will um, perhaps, um, if I have to abbreviate, I may then cut back on uh, week five, lecture two, which is on humanism, which is also important, but I'll get there uh, in the next lecture. Uh, but maybe try to abbreviate that. So if this lecture goes uh, over, depending on how much it goes over, we'll see and adjust accordingly. Um, that's one issue in terms of an in-person class you can always do. You can readjust fairly easily, but when it's online, it makes it a little bit more difficult, but we'll kind of try to do what we can do best and get through it one way or the other. And I'll try to keep in my mind, um, since I'm lecturing to you, at least in my mind, I'm lecturing to you. I can kind of see you all out there in the classroom as I'm talking, um, to keep that classroom time limit involved and make readjustments as needed uh, with just a, a video virtual format. So if things get kind of screwed up that way, my apologies, but we'll make do because um, this, I think, is an important lecture. So that being said, whew, we start with the first slide, namely uh, the universities and medieval universities and academic theology. And so here we go. It's actually the second slide, but the first content slide. The origins of the universities. Um, now, that too is a fantastic story. And it's one institution, a medieval institution that is still with us. Because in so many ways, um, the university, even though the university we're in right now, uh, we can still very clearly see it, its medieval roots uh, and structures and things in, in many ways. Now, the medieval universities, I think I mentioned that the word universitas in the early lectures about the basic structures of Christendom, that the word universitas referred to the guilds, um, and the communes in many ways that emerged, these corporate bodies, because universitas just means the whole, in one way it means the whole. Now it's also referred to as the universe is the whole of everything. If we study the universe, the universe out there, that's the, everything. Um, but the university um, began as a guild. I'm not going to go into all the details, even though they're fun stories about drunken students and bar fights and everything else. But we and we have different national traditions of scholarship arguing for the first university. And Italians will argue that it was in Bologna. Um, French will argue that it's in Paris, and the English will argue that it's in Oxford. Um, and everything, but the Paris is the model I'm going to 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 be following. Um, in some ways, at the time, this is from the early 13th century on. Paris became very clearly um, the place to go for theology. Bologna was the place to go for law, both civil law and um, canon law, ecclesiastical law. And Oxford was um, kind of a, a second rank, both for both theology and law. And that's those are all different. Um, arguments which which you get into the more of the late twelfth early thirteenth century intellectual history, which is not that important here. But what I do want you to know is that the universities, uh, especially with the Paris and these first big three, o Paris, Oxford, and Bologna, became very well established very early by the early thirteenth century. Before that, we have schools, we have cathedral schools, we have monastic schools. We don't have universities. University is a legal structure. And what happened, because of um, a series of events, the cathedral school at Paris, which had been under the bishop, where you could go and, and learn, I mean, you know, princes, French kings and princes would send their sons there who would be taking over to have some basic education. Um, so it was also for external issues, and it's not certainly not that everyone would only would go to the cathedral school at Paris to become a priest. The level of education for the priesthood was relatively low, unless you wanted to uh, have a career in the church. If you wanted to become uh, a bishop or an archbishop or perhaps someday pope, um, then you definitely needed to to have uh, an education. And before at least the later twelfth century. Um, you would go and study at the, at the cathedral school. The cathedral schools were basically independent teachers who were there who received a license to teach by the bishop. There was no like place that you knock on the door and says, welcome to the cathedral school of Paris. Um, 
it was you'd go to study with someone there. We'll be talking more about some of the, the developments at the Cathedral School of Paris um, before. But what happens was both the the teachers or the masters who were teaching in Paris and the students who were in Paris to learn organized and let's say unionized in many ways and were granted privileges in 1231 by the Pope um, to acknowledge the University of Masters and the University of Students at Paris. And the earliest documents we have is definitely in the plural, the Universitates, or the Universitas Magistrorum and Universitas um, Studentium, of the students and the masters, and that got shortened to the University of Paris. So that's kind of the origins that I just want you to keep in mind so we have an idea, so you have an idea in terms of how this all developed, because when we look at what was going on, especially after this legal structure was set, even though it's before as well, again, some of the basic structures in terms of curriculums and faculties uh, were already in place that we know as well. When I talk about curriculum and faculties, I'm talk what are we talking about? We're talking about uh, basically the distinction, what we consider today, between undergraduate and graduate degrees. Um, the first degree at the university was the Master of Arts, and the arts refer to the liberal arts. Um, there was technically a bachelor's degree, but it was very rarely taken. It would be someone who didn't really fulfill their uh, complete education. If you left after a couple of years of university, a few years of university, because I'll talk about that structure in a second, too. Um, you could maybe teach in a, in a small town. Um, that would be you know, better than a, a local teacher with very little education. But you could not teach at a university. Um, with a master's of arts, um, you were required to teach a couple of years at the university. Before you didn't, you could go on and teach anywhere if you're from Paris um, or Oxford. Bologna only later developed an arts faculty. They started as a law faculty. Um, but it was the, the license to teach anywhere. The, the, the licentia um, ubique docendi, to teach anywhere. And there's still a... a university degree in Europe and Canada called the licentiate. That's just the license to teach, which was granted by the bishop um, at first, anyway, before it became granted by the university. But the curriculum of the arts, um, we're all in liberal arts, at least this course is part of the liberal arts curriculum. Um, history is part of the liberal arts curriculum, but at this time, the, it referred to the seven liberal arts. Um, this is going to be important, too, for our next lecture in terms of humanism. The seven liberal arts were uh, a tradition that arose very early on uh, in the early Middle Ages, rising out of, uh, of the classical educational model. It would take to go too long to go into all of that, but it essentially was uh, a twofold division. Uh, seven liberal arts. First, the, the trivium um, and quadrivium. Now, you may have heard the word trivial. The English word trivial is derived from the trivium. The trivial, the trivium was not trivial in any way, shape, or form. It consisted of grammar, dialectic, and rhetoric. Grammar, though, was not, you know, subject, verb, which in Latin, of course, is different. Grammar was really, at least at the universities, Obviously, you had to know Latin. All teach, all instruction was in Latin. You had to speak Latin. You had to read Latin. Everything was done in Latin. Um, so you had to have a lot of grammar, Latin grammar, before you ever got to the university. And students went to the university when they were about 14 years old, 14 or 15. They started at university. And you would start with grammar. But grammar at the university was basically philosophical grammar. I don't know if uh, any of you are into linguistics. Um, there's still philosophical grammar. Uh, what makes uh, for uh, a direct object a direct object? Why is that there? How does language really work and function philosophically? Uh, this was going to be important, too, because one of the parts of speech is something called the copula. I know. Ha, 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 ha. The copula basis of our for term copulation. That's why I say ha ha ha. If you don't get it, oh, oh copula, copulation. Why? Because it joins two things together. That's what the copula does. It joins two things together. And in grammar, that is the verb to be or the verb to have. The verb to be is 
is. This was well, what does is mean? He said, talking about philosophical grammar, it's important. Because is is being. But is is an equation? If I say this is red, what does that really mean? We're talking about the being of whatever this signifies. Now, this was going to be very important when we get into the 16th century because part of the words of institution, which were part of the mass, hoc est corpus meum. This is my body. What does is mean? And these are people who are arguing these things having been trained in philosophical grammar as part of the trivium. Now, dialectic, essentially, we can think of it as logic. So we have grammar, philosophical language, and we have logic. How do you construct a logical argument once we have the grammatical philosophical structures in place? And then rhetoric is how do you persuade someone of your argument? So it's called the trivium because it's just the first three-fold division. That's what trivium means, three-part. That came first. And then if you finish the, the trivium and everything, you can leave with your Bachelor of Arts. But then you, for Master of Arts, you need to go on to the quadrivium, which were the kind of mathematical subjects of uh, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music. You say, what, music? Music was the theory of proportions. If any of you are music people, uh, you probably know that if you have a, a taut line, like on a piano or a guitar, so it's trying, and you pluck it, you hear a sound. Now, if you put your finger right in the middle and pluck half of it, you'll hear an octave higher. So what I'm talking about are the um, um, intervals. A second, a third, a fourth, a fifth, a sixth, a seventh, and an octave. Then we have major and minor intervals and half steps and full whole steps. If you play, ever play the piano, you know what I'm talking about. If you've ever done anything probably other than sing, because no offense, but singers often don't know much about musical theory. But anyway, but my apologies if any of you are you know, opera singers out there. You probably do know a great deal about it. But my point being is that these intervals are proportions. That's mathematical. So music was the, the mathematical study of proportions. It wasn't teaching people how to sing. They knew, needed to know how to sing, and there was, I'll talk about this in a second, but with the mendicant <coughs> orders, they had their own schools. <coughs> and one of the very elementary school first schools you would go to as a monk was the, the Scola in Canto, the school in singing, where you would learn how to chant and follow a tune and sing. That is not music in the sense of the liberal art. Now, geometry, obviously, we know what geometry is, I think, I hope. Um, arithmetic is mathematics. It's not just adding and subtracting. Um, and at Oxford, I think I've already mentioned the Oxford calculators at Oxford um, were very sophisticated, almost developed calculus. They came that close to it, and they were doing so all with Roman numerals. Well, they also they, they were using Arabic numerals, numerals too, but they didn't really have the notation to develop calculus, but they came very close to it. So if you're you know, a historian of mathematics is, or even a science of any type, it can be very difficult because you're just trying to figure out what the hell, you know, all these ciphers are saying, these numbers. You have to do a lot of translating of numbers into two numbers that we can understand, but that's kind of another point. So those were the, the, the four uh, part study, the quadrivium, and together the trivium and the quadrivium comprise the seven liberal arts. Very heavy on philosophy, on, gram, on, on, on logic, and on scientific things, astronomy. Um, and at the time, astronomy and astrology were almost the same. Two different words, but um, there was like scientific astrology, which was basically astronomy because it was not you know fortune-telling. It was more of looking at what are the physical effects of the planets on you know, bodies on Earth especially when you're born within a certain configuration, is there an effect of you know, the, the moons and the planets and the stars uh, on Earth? It's like, well, yeah, they have a, an effect. So that change who we are and how we think. So it's, it, it's more that approach in terms of astrology. 
Uh, there were people who were fortune tellers and everything else, and astrologers who tried to, to speculate. But in terms of, of academic aspects, astrology and astronomy often in the university context were almost used interchangeably. Also very mathematical. Now, that's kind of the curriculum that we're looking at. Um, why go to university? Um, because it offered uh, a career, and increasingly so. Um, same way here to offer a career, either in the church or in service of, of a king, a prince, or so. Um, and there were two graduate faculties. I'm mean, talking about the Faculty of Arts. You could also just go on and teach arts. And there were, you know, teachers of arts at the university who uh, just stayed as masters of arts at the university. And I should say, too, that the, they're, at least in terms of the masters of arts, um, teaching of arts, that's it's not equivalent at all, but it's the same kind of level as uh, Master of Arts. If you get an MA today, uh, it would be like if you get an MA, you can teach at the university. That used to be the case in, in European, but that's gets a whole other issue. But it's, it's probably better to think of the Masters of, of Arts as a doctor, a PhD, and the same for the graduate faculties, because there were two graduate faculties, and you had to first have your Master of Arts before you could go on to the graduate faculty. You had to have your Master of Arts, and then do your requisite couple of years of teaching there, and then you could start studying theology or law or later on medicine. Paris didn't really, I'm, I'm not sure off the top of my head if they even had a medical school, but Montpellier uh, was the famous place for medicine. Um, there were other places for medicine, too, if you wanted to become a medical doctor, which was not um, surgery. That's a whole other issue in terms of the history of medicine. Uh, it was basically studying ancient texts like Galen, um, studying the human bodies, but not based on dissection, studying what you know Aristotle and Galen had written about health and medicine and how to heal but that's a whole nother issue um and for us doesn't really concern us too much but you could have a great career potentially if you came out and got your master's in theology or master's in law um which would definitely was more like a phd because it was a long and arduous process especially for theology uh, it would take at least, uh, well, for the mendicant orders, it would take at least 14 years um, to get your, mas your, your Master of Theology after your Master of Arts. A long and arduous process, and the same for law. Um, a lot of years of study had to go into it. You could get your law degree in law, your Master's of Civil Law, or a Canon Law, or some of both. And that even took longer. So that is kind of the structure with the faculties and then the organization and how do we handle overall the relationship between the Faculty of Arts and the Faculty of Theology at Paris and there were tensions there over what could be taught, how it could be taught, um, because some themes apply to both, like God, like, you know, the origins of creation. Um, is matter eternal or not? Uh, some of those issues could be handled theologically or in terms of philosophically. So we could almost think of the arts faculty as a philosophical faculty and then theology and law. Now, that's, there were tensions all over the place, um, even as this was kind of the basic structure. So if I go back without messing myself up and look to see where we are, patrons and career paths, yeah, you could have, if you've got your master's of theology or your, master, or your master's in law, canon or civil law, um, your opportunities were more open to you. Surprise, surprise. Becoming a lawyer, becoming a theologian. In uh, Christendom, courts were interested in you. The church, all the bishops, you know, needed people to help. This is kind of building the administration. And they needed educated people to help out with all of this. And so there were career paths available to students as well as simply studying to become whatever you know if you're a mendicant and this is the difference between the mendicants and the mendicants i hope you know what they are about by now basically uh, leaving out the carmelites um which is not really fair to the carmelites and i realize that but it's the franciscans uh, dominicans and the augustinian hermits whom i've already talked about now they had their own schools i think i just mentioned the school in Kantu. um they had their, also their, their schools all the way to teach theology, the Studia Generalia. They had a separate structure. Um, and it was only with the Augustinians um, when Giles of Rome, 
became the first chair of theology at the University of Paris, that then there was a link between the Studium Generale and the general school of the Augustinians in Paris and the University of Paris. But that gets into some of the nitty gritties and doesn't have too much impact on our understanding of what's going to be happening and developing by just putting it out there that for Luther, for example, he's at Wittenberg, but he's also lecturing to the Augustinians in the studium at Wittenberg. They're one and the same, even though there's a technical distinction. The same thing when he was teaching at Air Force and studying at both places. So it gets to be administratively, institutionally interesting. And then there's conflicts. Uh, with, we'll see with Luther between Erfurt and Wittenberg in terms of where he should receive his Master of Theology degree. Uh, Erfurt said, no, he should definitely get it here. And Wittenberg said, no, he's going to get it here. And that caused conflict. But we'll get there when we get there. Um, but this kind of the administrative institutional conflicts and structures I wanted to bring forward because Luther is a part of that, as we will see. Okay, moving right along. Theology at the University. Um, what did it consist of? Theology at the University it consisted of lectures on two texts. Um, one text was the Bible, so you would hear lectures on the Bible, my Masters of Theology. The other text um, were, was called the Sentences of Peter Lombard. Peter Lombard was a 12th century Parisian scholar um, at the Cathedral School, and he wrote a book called the, Four, the Sentences, which are basically propositions or statements. I mean, our term sentence is not all that different from the sentencia and then in the plural sentencia uh, that Lombard was, was meaning. These are theological statements that could be defended. Um, it became the standard theological textbook from the later 12th century, um, early 13th century, because it's, it's completed by 1159. Sentences. Peter Lombard completed his sentence by 1159. By 1220 it becomes the standard required textbook of theology. Now at Paris, the sentences came first. So first you would study the sentences, then you'd study the Bible or hear lectures on the Bible. Whereas at Oxford, it was the other way around. First you heard lectures on the Bible, and then you went to the sentences. So there's two different approaches, but still both of those comprise the the, the curriculum. Just as in the arts, in the faculty of arts, you didn't study grammar. You would study Priscian. Priscian was the author of a text. You would study text, and the lectures would be on the text. Or you'd study Aristotle. And increasingly, in the 13th century, Aristotle became the, the, the overwhelming um, required reading in lectures. So you would not just take a course in logic, you'd have to listen to le lectures on Aristotle's categories, and then on his um, 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 prior analytics, and then on his posterior analytics, and then on his sophistical re refutations. Um, so it's heavily based on logic, and heavily based on Aristotle. It's also important because logic and debate was how you received your degree. Um, I'm skipping around now. I know I shouldn't be, but this is like theology at the university. Um, little bullet point under medieval universities and academic theology. And this that kind of somehow fits because you would have to take part in debates. Um, you, so you'd go to lectures. The master would, you know, of arts or also of theology, same thing, would go in and give their lecture on a given text, whether it is a book of the Bible, whether it is on uh, Lombard, one of the books of Lombard, whether it is on Aristotle's physics or uh, Aristotle's, yeah, his, his prior analytics. Um, and you take notes. You have to listen, take notes. And you basically try to memorize the text. And you just list, there were no exams and things. You just study with the individual, the master, and the master would accept you as a student, and you would study with him. But you could hear other lectures as well of other masters. And you would have to then, when you felt ready, or when the master felt you were ready, participate in a debate, which was called a disputation. 
where the master would say, okay, here's a question. We're going to be asking a question. You, Bob, I'm using male names because basically only males went. We'll come back to that in a second. Bob, you have to defend the pro position. You have to argue for this thesis. This is a thesis. You have to argue for it. And John, you have to argue against it, or the con position. And we're going to have a public debate, and whoever wins gets a point. And you had to have so many points before you could then be called promoted or put forward for your degree. You had to successfully participate in so many disputations. And then what, as a master, what I would do, that after Bob and John had their debate going out, I would then resolve the question. I mean, I would settle the question with my answer to it, and then say, who won? basically. So there's that form of debate that you were trained to do. Now, in a debate, you can't really use notes. We'll hear about this with Luther. Um, you have to really know your stuff. Memorization was huge. You had to kind of memorize things. Uh, you memorized a lot. You memorized the text. You remember, memorized your master's lectures. Um, yeah, you did take notes on the text. You could copy down the text, and you could buy copies of the text from the booksellers. Uh, this is all fantastic stuff, and I'm, again, getting distracted by uh, the increasingly seeing the necessity of going into increasing amounts of detail on this. <coughs> but it is directly relevant, as we will see next week at some point. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and so this is. The content and the same thing with theology. So by the time you get to the theological studies, you've already had how many years? You have to be you know, at least twenty-two before I think twenty-one before you can be a bachelor or a master of theology. So you had at least seven years of study, of undergraduate education, of debating. You know, we didn't start off debating, but you know you have to listen to lecture a few years and then you start debating and think to go. And so there would be little lectures in the morning of the master and then graduate students, so to speak, or uh, more advanced students would run basically review sessions in the afternoon. They would go over the text, make sure you didn't miss anything, and on we go. So it's that kind of a structure. And the same applied for the arts faculties and the theology faculties and the law faculties. The same approach. It's called the scholastic approach. I've probably heard about scholasticism. Scholasticism... <laughs> To that ism, which is a problem, um, but it just means the what was taught at the schools and how was how was scholarship done? Because scholasticism is the the root is scholastic. The adjective is, is scholastic, which refers to what happens in the scola, which are the schools. So the scholastics were the schoolmen, as they were also called, those people who were involved at the university. Scholasticism was not some, you know, it's been argued, it's faith and reason, harmonization and Thomism. That's a whole other debate, and it's not historically viable in my view. Scholasticism is the method of teaching and learning at the universities. That's all it is. And that's going to be important when we get to Luther's disputation against scholastic theology, even though he's being very scholastic in doing that disputation, but we'll get there when we get there because things do kind of change in the later 50s, <coughs> excuse me, the early 16th century. <coughs> now, that I hope if you have any questions, again, just shoot me an email and I can elaborate more and try, hope to clarify more. But that was how it was structured. Now, the sentences just think of the impact of that. Um, one textbook, and then the Bible. If there could be one textbook for the Reformation that everyone in the, the country, if not the world, used, there'd be a commonality. Well, obviously, there's some commonality already just because of the chronological development, etc. But there, everyone is commenting on the same text. So what you do before you could actually receive your, mas your Masters of Theology, you had to yourself lecture on the sentences. So you got to a certain point towards the end of your 
time of studies where he said, okay, I'm going to begin or incept my lectures on the sentences. You give your lectures. You would try to, to refute the position of your fellow students who were lecturing on the sentences maybe as well. Because you're in competition, same thing with the debate. You're always debating. And why is that important? Well, who wins the debates have a better chance of getting a job, not only getting promoted, but of getting a job. If you can make a name for yourself in the university by being a great debater or disputator, so it becomes very kind of contentious and argumentative, and you start needing to know the sources better. We'll talk about that. We already did with the Augustinians. And this how it was done. That's how the learning and teaching was done. You had to be, I think, 35 before you could um, be a master of theology. Long, arduous process. A lot of training. A lot of studying. And with the Mendicants, you also then had to spend time with the Augustinians anyway. I think the Dominicans and the Franciscans are similar. But I know the Augustinians. You had to you know, spend a couple of years teaching um, in a couple of different places. So that was even more extended. Um, you could bypass being a master of arts because supposedly you already had that training in your order schools. Anyway, that gets more complex. And we'll get there with Luther too of how that applies and doesn't and relates to him, but you need to see this whole structure. Because in the post schism world, that long, arduous period of, let's say, at least 14 years to be a master of theology, standards started being thrown out the door, and it kept being decreased and decreased and decreased. Luther received his master of theology in three years. Some people even less. Stout is less. So what was being required, what was needed, there's a huge decline in standards after the schism. And I'm jumping kind of ahead here, because I think this is on a slide for later on, but it's important to keep on mind now, because the, the picture I'm trying to draw for you um, is one of rigor and extensive rigor for a long period of time that applies to the 13th century then even more so the 14th century and then begins to completely dissipate in the 15th century which affects the theology overall the learning the understanding the training as well as the type of theology that is being done and the purpose and focus of it I'm kind of jumping ahead here um, to the decline of theological studies and the shift to moral theology. Oh, I'm still in the same slide, so at least it, I just kind of skipped over a couple of bullet points here, uh, going from the theology of the university to the decline of theological studies, which kind of makes sense. But the point is that this basic model at Paris that I've been talking about, um, for the 13th century, there's basically Paris, Oxford, and Bologna. Uh, and the Montpellier from early on in the 13th century, um, and the medical school primarily. But beginning in the later 13th century on into the 14th century, there is a real growth and spread of universities. New foundations of universities. Now, I mentioned that at Paris, it was a cathedral school uh, under the bishop. Uh, the same thing in Oxford. Bologna was distinct. It was under, actually, the, the prince and the emperor, actually, Frederick, uh, Frederick Barbarossa and then Frederick II. Um, in the 13th century, granted legal scholars in, in Bologna rights, and Bologna traces its origins back to the you know, early 12th century bit based on that, but um, that wasn't a full-fledged university yet. They didn't have uh, an arts faculty until much later. That still was an issue um, kind of growing up with me. It still used to be, uh, there was a clear distinction between colleges and universities. Um, and that too is a medieval distinction. There were colleges at the University of Paris. The Sorbonne is the most famous one that's still there. 
Um, but here in the United States, a college was a four-year institution, like liberal arts colleges. And to be a university, you really had to have at least one graduate faculty, if not two. But all of a sudden, things got, a, got opened up. Uh, I forget exactly when, in the 80s or I think probably. And people started changing the names because it sounds better. Like Marion College used to be Marion College and somewhat recently since the time I've been in Indianapolis and it goes back to 2004 um, it changed its name to Marion University now it does have graduate faculties but it's like okay it doesn't so the term is problematic but my point here is that for medieval universities same issue we have the classic universities of Paris, Oxford, Bologna and then they start spreading a new establishments both by princes and kings and then by bishops the spread of universities in the 14th century just keeps expanding and growing and growing and on into the 15th century and on into the 16th century and that is important too because the university of wittenberg where luther was was a very new university 1502 it was founded by frederick the wise why? Because Electoral Saxony did not have a university. Ducal Saxony did. If you remember, maybe I haven't talked about it yet, but I will when I get there. Uh, the Duchy of Saxony, which was one of the seven electors. I'll get there when I get there, but this is not all that relevant, except for the point I want to make. Uh, I'll come back to this point. The irrelevant part that I'm talking about right now will be very relevant later on which I'll come back to. But the Duchy of Saxony was split, and uh, one brother got the title Duke, and the other, pro uh, elector, uh, or other brother got the title, title Elector. Um, and in Ducal Saxony, there was the University of Leipzig. Uh, in Electoral Saxony, there wasn't a university. And so Frederick the Wise establishes his own university in 1502, and that is going to be very important for understanding the, the institutional context of Luther and what was going on at the time. The whole point is that it's growing. And as things grow and spread, they also leads to changes in standards and rigors and everything else. Now, another development, I have the Vegas Strait, the Via Antique one, the Via Moderna. Um, I'm not going to go into much. Um, I mean, this is already, as I said, I'm on the first slide. And I've spent uh, most of the time for today's lecture. I want to think about this as I go along. Um, it's an institution, I'm just going to mention, because it's only mentioned, uh, I think the Via Moderna is mentioned once uh, in your textbook on page 18, because I looked it up right before my uh, beginning of this lecture. Uh, this refers to nominalism. Um, that will come back later with Luther, the Via Antiqua and the Via Moderna. What it means is it came, uh, if you read anything else other than the textbook and listening to my lectures here, uh, you can be very confused because a lot has been made of these two VA, and that's what the German word Wegestreit means. Weg is in German is way. This is just the fight of the ways. Um, and Via Antiqua is the old way, and the Via Moderna is the new way. Um, and what it was really about was an institutional debate for how the art should be taught. Some universities, some of these new universities were established as universities that were going to be teaching according to the old way, others according to the new way. And the whole term of nominalism, also that ism, is horribly problematic. Um, and too much has been made out of that too. Um, there is no such historical term until the later 14th century in terms of nominalism or the nominalists. It has to be a whole issue. But the problem is here is Luther refers to himself as a nominalist. And he refers to himself as a follower of Occam. Uh, he refers to Occam as you know, Magister Meus, my teacher. It was Occam. Occam was a Franciscan theologian and philosopher in the 14th century. I think I've already mentioned him that he wrote for John the 22nd. And Luther was studying and had studied at Erfurt and then at Wittenberg as part of this Via Moderna that looked back to Occam as the way and approach to teach the arts and then at some universities, the theology too. Because at some universities, they had then also this distinction between the Via Antiqua and Via Moderna and theology. And that is then begins to be interesting. And at Wittenberg, Luther was part of the 
Via Moderna within the theology faculty, which also had the Via Antiqua, both a ways of reproaches. And we'll see that conflict um, early on, too, talking about Luther uh, with Andreas Bodenstamp and Karlstadt, who was in the chair for, for, for the Via Antiqua at, at Wittenberg. Anyway, this gets very complex into late medieval logic and metaphysics was behind it as well as then bantering uh, because there was a lot of banter going on it's like fraternities at the University of Tübingen in Germany they had uh, both VA for the arts and in theology they had different um, dormitories and they had different times of graduation and everything else promotion graduation um, so it could really be on various different levels and so much has been made out of it and I don't want to go into all of that but if you ever come across it other than what you've what I've just been saying here, or what the one mention of the Via Moderna in, in Lindbergh, please ask me about it because it can be very confusing. And I would, I'm going out on a limb here, but I say 97% of what you might read about the Via Moderna, the Via Antiqua, and the Vegastrite and nominalism is wrong. That's a whole other issue. So, but it is part of the university structure. Now, I have up there, too, the decline of theological studies and the shift in moral theology, which I already kind of skipped ahead to, the decline just in the number of years it took to become a master of theology. There's a lowering of standards. In three years, you can't you know, know as much, learn as much, develop as much as you can in 12 to 14 years. You also, in that 12 to 14 or so years, you have time for you are, are, are teaching yourself, are going out and teaching. And if you're a mendicant, one of the religious orders, you can go out and teach in your local school. So you're kind of this applied learning, so to speak. If you shorten all of that to a three year period or less, it's a problem. Luther started, just an example, started studying university. Um, relatively late too. He becomes a master of arts in 1505. Um, I forget exactly when he started uh, at the university. But I don't think he, you know, he didn't start when he was 14, I don't think. So it's, um, he had a condensed education all the way along. And that's what happens. That's one of the impacts of the schism. And also one of the impacts of the Black Death. The decrease in population, the need for people. We see also a decrease, and that's also the observable, because we see a decrease in the level of religious requirements for becoming a member of the religious orders. And if people are needed, if people are, are you know, jobs are available, standards are reduced to fill those positions. That's what was going on. And with that, okay, if you only have, uh, if you have a, a relatively limited number of years to study, you may not really understand all the technical points of academic theology. What is the difference between Thomas, Aquinas, and Scotus in terms of their lectures on the sentences? Um, and how is that different from Thomas's, you know, Summa Theologica? How is that different from, you know, Scotus's Ordinatio as opposed to his Expositio or Reputatio? It becomes very complex and that gets to be reduced. And what can you teach? How to live. What does it mean to be a Christian? How do you live a Christian life? There's a shift to moral theology. What do we need? How do we live in order to be saved? Who cares what the, the, the speculative theological positions are about that? But let's focus on what do we need to do to be saved? And what do we preach to the people and tell the people that they need to do to be saved? 